Alrighty, they added a big old glyph that says desecrated ground increases damage, and at the very least, we know that Shadow Blood Wave has desecrated ground in its tooltip, and this thing is going to add an absolute metric ton of damage. So, and let me just say right off the bat, I'm not sure if anybody has already coined a term for Shadow Blood Wave. I tried to Google this one. I didn't see anybody calling it that. I want to go ahead and call it Shadow Surfer until somebody gives me a better name, but I think Shadow Surfer is pretty good. Welcome to the Shadow Blood Wave Necromancer. I think this thing is going to absolutely tear through content at the very least for like speed farming and upwards of like tiers 70 to 80 nightmare dungeons and we've also built it out so hopefully it has consistent damage output against single targets and big tanky bosses because once you stagger them you're going to be applying a massive amount of damage over time but let's go ahead and go through the entirety of the build i'm maintaining this build planner in the discord i know i've been saying this a lot recently but i'm trying to advertise the get the discord right so if you come on down, you can check all the build guides that we're currently theory crafting in the Discord. The link is down in the description below. I'm going to be maintaining all the link guides here. Once they're in max roll guides, uh, obviously it'll transition to that part. If we never end up making a max roll guide for it, because it's only something that really exists like in a season, in a niche concept, we'll maintain the build planner here. We'll maintain a YouTube guide of it. And then you can also check any like relevant data sheets that I have going right now. We have the vampire powers analysis per build guide. So if you haven't checked it out, go ahead and go there so you can find all these links whenever you need them. But I'm going to put timestamps to everything down below. We're going to go over the gear, the aspects, the book of the dead, the vampire powers, the paragon tree, the skill tree. So you know what we're trying to accomplish here. But I think this build is going to be really strong. So the primary conceit of the build is the fact that there's always been this kind of shadow blood wave thing that existed inside of the meta that everybody just kind of said like, yes, it's something. Yes, it's good. It does stuff. But what does it really do? And we really want to capitalize on the new glyph that's coming in season two called Desecration. Desecration says for every five willpower they have within range, meaning at a maximum bonus of 54 willpower in the Paragon tree, you're going to increase your desecrated ground damage by basically 60%. So just real quick napkin map, that means about 600% additive damage for desecrated ground effects. And as far as we can tell, there's only two definite desecrated ground effects in the game that actually say desecrated. There is Boots of the Empty Tomb with Sever, and then Ultimate Shadow with Blood Wave. There might be things for Blighted Corpse Explosion, might be things for Blood Soaked on Blood Mist, but until we get a clarify, we can't go any further. The second bonus of it is while you're standing in desecrated ground, you're going to deal 1.15 times your shadow damage. So you're going to get a new 15% damage multiplier just by standing on top of your shadow blood wave. So when I think about how the build is supposed to pilot, the basic concept is you're going to walk up to a group of monsters. If you don't have your might aspect active, you're going to hemo them one time with hemorrhage. You're going to toss on decrepify, which applies slow automatically, obviously the damage reduction as well, but this is going to be our mechanism for very quickly reducing cooldown and then we're going to toss in blood wave we're also going to take every single additive damage source that says damage to slowed since that's one of the biggest total additive uh, damage buckets that you can gain access to and then this thing is going to rip through with the title aspect dropping down three sets of massive desecrated shadow damage as well as dealing shadow damage on impact and then also dropping blood orbs the reason why those blood orbs are going to be so important is because with fast blood every single time we pick one up we're going to reduce the cooldown by 1.5 seconds of our ultimate abilities stack on a ton of cooldown reduction some of the new vampire powers and we should be able to pretty proactively spam shadow blood wave all the time so not only just doing a ton of damage itself but also continuously procking the shadow blight effect to get instantaneous critical sources of damage as well Putting it all together, we should be fairly tanky be able to overheal all the time with blood orbs and just be able to ride out the wave hence the Shadow Surfer name, while we come through on our Blood Mist, which means that we're completely invulnerable to damage while we pick up the Blood Orbs, and when we come back out, we're going to hit him with another Blood Wave, Ad Nauseam. The idea is to basically perpetually be crowd controlling the entirety of the screen, and then even against a single target like a boss, we can always rely on just spamming Corpse Explosion to be able to generate corpses and consume corpses. 
because when you toss on embalmer that's going to help to generate as many blood orbs as possible corpse tendrils will generate blood orbs the blood wave itself will generate blood orbs so this machine of perpetually spamming through the skills should work pretty well now that you understand what the concept of the build is let's go ahead and look at the skill tree and how we're maximizing it it's pretty simple because it turns out that you have the exact number of points that you would need to max out the primary multipliers of this build. We're going with Hemorrhage because Hemorrhage says it generates blood orbs. On top of that, it gains an additional 20% attack speed for being healthy. And what this means is that we're able to proc a pretty decent lucky hit chance against a target like a boss, be able to not only generate corpses, but generate the blood orbs, which will then feed into things like huge flesh. So we get a massive recurring source of additional corpses. So even if the blood wave doesn't get us there, the corpse explosion will. Obviously maxing out blood mist because realistically, this is also kind of relying on the infinimus package as opposed to just relying on corpse explosion as our primary damage output we do have the activatable for the blood wave and this means that it's going to be a lot more likely for us to be able to stay an infinimist whenever we need to generating corpses obviously maxing out corpse explosion for its damage turning into bloody corpse explosion to work with the build we're obviously going to be consuming a ton of corpses so fueled by death on deck we're also using death's reach a lot of the stats that we're picking go into increasing damage versus distant targets because i think with the constant knockback of Blood Wave, most monsters that can be crowd controlled should probably be getting pushed out of the close distance. If it turns out that you end up just like right in the middle of monsters all the time, we would obviously want to swap over to close damage as well as swapping over to Death's Embrace. Obviously, we're using Adhorrent Decrepify to be able to manage our cooldowns even further and then Amplify for the additional damage multiplier. Corpse Tendrils, picking up Blighted Corpse Tendrils for more Blood Orbs. Whenever we engage a pack, we're going to be starting off with Blood Mist walking in. We'll have a corpse. We'll be able to Corpse Tendrils, pull everything in. In, miss through again, do the blood wave, etc. You might be noticing that we're not picking up a form of vulnerable in the skill tree because we're actually going to get that from the vampire powers. So just like season one, there's going to be some things that you can do with these builds just because the powers exist that you wouldn't normally be able to do on eternal. And basically on eternal, you would just sacrifice ever gaining access to the vulnerable damage multiplier, which also means when you're book of the dead bonuses would just be completely dead in the water, but there's not a lot that you can do about that. Then we're going to go through and maximize everything in the darkness tree, making sure to focus on gloom as the best damage multiplier, crippling darkness for a huge amount of stagger against bosses, and then being able to ramp up our movement speed with Reaper's Pursuit as we charge through content. Obviously, Blood Wave, Supreme Blood Wave, and then we're picking up Standalone, as well as Memento Mori, and then obviously Shadow Blight here. Now, let's very quickly go through the gear. I'm not going to stop on every single stat here, but I'm just going to go through the things that you might not be able to pick up just immediately looking at the piece of gear for... The weapon, we're obviously going with the wand for the most to lucky hit. And then for the damage types, again, we're going with distant enemies and slowed enemies. Being able to continuously apply slow and stun to the target with massive overlaying damage over time, I think we're going to be staggering bosses incredibly quickly. And then this is where we're putting on ultimate shadow. And you'll notice I'm using diamonds for ultimate skill damage. I want to test out whether or not the ultimate skill damage here will actually work for the desecrated ground that's being left. You can always just go with damage over time gems here, which is what I think will ultimately move over to. And I don't think that any other gems are really worth your while of using. For the focus, since we're not able to generate barrier, you're gonna notice a slight reduction in overall lucky hit ability. We're taking lucky hit, cooldown reduction, and then I put damage reduction from shadowed targets here because we can't rely on having barrier. So we do need to be a little bit tankier than the typical Infinimus build needs to be so that we don't just get one shot when we pop out of mist. Here's where we're putting blood soaked so that we can maintain our movement speed also there is a chance that the blood mist blood soak aspect also counts as desecrated ground it'll depend on how these keywords are actually added to different skills and obviously it's just a really good tool for being able to proc as many instances of shadow blight as possible for the boots there's actually a world where you could just be using the empty tomb boots to get the additional lucky hit chance and the additional damage reduction but i do like stacking as much intelligence as possible since our wither legendary node is going to proc off of intelligence and we're going to be getting so much of it in our power on board you'll notice i have over a thousand intelligence on this build so i would like to be able to get intelligence in all stats and then of course the ranks to corpse tendrils to be able to reduce that cooldown as well and this is where we're putting ghost walker we're going to get that from blood mist so huge uh, movement boost there and then also from metamorphosis and the vampire powers but we'll touch on those in just a little bit on the pants damage reduction and corpse explosion and then maximum life and this is where we're putting embalmer so we're able to generate blood orbs at a good enough rate to be able to spam blood wave if needed and then moving on to the gloves you'll notice that we're not using how from below we actually just need one more aspect slot to be able to fit title onto the very typical blood mist build 
I also don't think that Howl from Below necessarily outperforms Legendary Gloves here. We're able to pick up crit chance for our Shadow Blight procs, a huge amount of lucky hit chance, just like on Howl from Below, but then Shadow Damage over time, which acts as a multiplier for Shadow Blight, and then obviously base intelligence. For the armor, as much damage reduction, armor, and life as you can get onto it, and then obviously we're using Explosive Mist. Remember that walking out of Season 1, we're not going to have the Sacrilegious Heart. It's not going to be casting Corpse Explosion and Corpse Tendrils for us. We're going to need to do a lot more manual casting than we did previously and obviously this helps to automate it a bit and makes it more likely that we'll succeed at being an infinimus build or the helmet rather than having lucky at chance when we have barrier since we don't get no barrier we're going to go back to total armor here and then we're also picking up might for the damage reduction this is also why i want to use hemorrhage as opposed to something like reap reap is definitely great but Hemorrhage allows me to gain 20% damage reduction from the edge of the screen when I attack a monster, whereas Rape requires me to be in melee range. And again, we basically want to be outside of close range on this build as often as possible, not only for our survivability, but for our damage output. For the Amulet, Gloom, Movement Speed, Cooldown Reduction, and then again, I'm taking Shadow Damage over time. You could also put Armor here for more survivability. And then we're slotting on Blighted here for the biggest overall damage multiplier for all of our stuff. Makes sense. We're still using Diamonds in our jewelry right now without knowing exactly what resistance are going to look like but as always don't be surprised if this gets updated to like one ruby one sapphire one emerald and then you end up putting two resistances onto your boots or picking up some more res in your paragon tree for the rings maximum life lucky hit chance crit chance and then damage to slowed you can also do damage to targets affected by shadow here although i don't think that that's nearly as good and this is where we're dropping aspect of decay to bump up our shadow blight as much as possible and then for the second ring this is where we're fitting fast blood so that we get the 1.5 second cooldown reduction on blood wave every time we pick up an orb what it basically means is like with our vampire power and the amount of cooldown reduction that we have and a single cast of blood wave it should really only be like five to nine seconds before you can cast it again and that's not including anything from corpse tendrils anything from embalmer and anything from hemorrhage i truly believe that when you put all these things together you should be able to cast your shadow blood wave once every three to five seconds depending on the like total density of monsters with more density meaning more likely to cast it for the paragon tree i'm not going to go into an exceptional amount of detail but i want to touch on the glyphs that we're using in the boards just so you can have an idea again the build planner is in my discord link below you can always check it out there and just copy it if you like it or min max it or change it the way that you would prefer to build it in our starter board we're going with scourge since this is going to be based off of intelligence i do value the darkness glyph over here in flesh eater at a higher value than scourge because always increasing my shadow damage means that everything is going to be more powerful whereas scourge is only going to apply to shadow blight our desecrated ground and our corpse explosion you might go well that's basically all of your damage and you're not wrong but we do have other sources of shadow damage that i want to make sure is getting the biggest total boost in the wither board we're putting control obviously this is great since it's going to get that free 1.1 multiplier when we have slow to target which both blood wave and decrepify does and then once corpse tendrils comes down it gives us the big 1.2 multiplier and then a huge amount of additive damage so the moment that we stagger a boss we gain access to that as well building into flesh eater i already touched on it but this is where we're going to be putting darkness as our biggest total intelligence board available and then i do also build down to stifle i'm going to build into damage first healthy and damage first injured just a little bit because getting such a big total additive damage bonus against 55 percent of the monster's total health seems like a pretty good investment of points at the very least, if you're looking for more points, you could absolutely pull out of this node right here. But I just wanted to point out why I put it in there because it's a little bit of an interesting choice. Coming out of the top of Wither, we're going to build into Scent of Death, and this is where we're putting Imbiber for another huge total additive damage bonus. This is over here, while it currently says Undaunted, the reason why that is is because Desecration is a will node and Undaunted is a will node. So I just wanted to be able to represent the choices that we're making here, but we don't care about anything else in Blood Begets Blood. I don't think it's worth it to build all the way around to get this Blood or multiplier we just want to get the glyph socket we just want to get as much will as possible so we can get the biggest total additive damage as possible there so if you haven't seen the sheet before basically what i went through and i read every single power and i go does it even work for the build at all then i sat down and go does it realistically fit into the build and if i ever had a reason why yes or no i would write down some notes here and then what you have is my recommendations these are the vampire powers i think are legitimately worth your while to use because we're going to gain even more cooldown reduction and an additional multiplier for our ultimate because anticipation gives you that cdr 
for your ultimates, and then also increases it for each nearby enemy affected by your damage over time effects. Everything we do is damage over time effects. So the moment that we are ever within the pocket of monsters and we use Blood Wave to knock them all back and then we run away to get that damage to distant modifier, we're going to get a huge total multiplier here. And I actually think that this might apply to the desecrated ground that's left behind. We'll obviously need to test that. If it does, that's a crazy damage multiplier. If not, it's still good for the initial damage that Shadow Wave does because it does turn into a darkness skill that does shadow damage on the initial hit as well. Then we're looking at Prey on the Weak. The reason why Prey on the Weak is so important is not only does it just give us another multiplier against targets that are vulnerable, but it adds on the effect that if a monster is affected by a vampiric curse, then they're considered to be vulnerable. This is how we shore up our Book of the Dead, which I can also touch on very quickly. We're obviously sacrificing Reapers for the shadow damage, but then we're sacrificing Cold for the vulnerable damage multiplier. Since we can't get it from our skills, we can only get it from the Vampire Curse. That's why we're not losing out on a sacrifice here. And then lastly, we're sacrificing Iron Golem so that whenever Shadow Blight manages to actually crit, we're going to get an additional multiplier there. Back to the Vampire Powers. This is so important because it also incentivizes us to actually use a Cursed Touch. The other cool thing about a Cursed Touch, which if you haven't seen it, gives you a lucky hit chance to be able to apply Vampiric Curse. Then the enemies can also spread the curse. I don't think that's super relevant, but it says that a Cursed Souls deal an additional 200% damage. As long as these souls do any damage at all, every single time that we use Blood Mist, we're going to release the Accursed Souls. We're going to have the Vulnerable proc up from Prey on the Weak. We're going to be doing a bunch of additional damage with all these Cursed Souls, and that might also help us out to deal an additional ton of damage to single targets like bosses, another issue that typical builds like this tend to struggle with. Then for the last two, we're using Flowing Veins. Flowing Veins, to remind you, says that you deal an additional 60% damage over time to enemies that are moving, so generally running towards us after we knock them back or affected by Vampiric Curse. So this means we could actually have everything stuck in a corpse tendrils. And because we're applying Vampiric Curse so easily with all of our lucky hit bonuses and modifiers, we just get this additional damage over time on top of all of the other multipliers for shadow damage over time that we're already doing. And then lastly, Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is absolutely disgusting. Gives you another source of unstoppable, does a huge amount of damage when you dodge through monsters, and then also applies Vampiric Curse against them. You can use this to be able to quickly apply it to a boss to engage, just so you have that vulnerable proc on them to get the total amount of your damage multipliers up. But just having another source of unstoppable on the kit that's already using Ghost Walkers to be able to run super fast after you've gained unstoppable just means we are going to be the fastest version of the Necromancer that we've seen to date, and I'm really excited to finally not be the slowest class in the game 100% of the time. But there you go. Again, I'm going to link to this build planner in the description down below. Check out everything that you need to see here. Let me know what your own theory crafting has led you to. Do you have any ways of improving this? Do you think that there's anything that I missed? As always, I'd love to hear from you down below. Also, if you've been really excited about this content, you've enjoyed this level of theory crafting, consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. We're on a huge upswing now. That season two is looking really good for people. I'm so excited that people are actually going to get the game that they wanted to play, or at least a much better version of it. And I look forward to just like smashing through all this cool new content, target farming all my uber uniques, getting a Shaco, salvaging it because it's actually kind of interesting how niche of an item it is. And hopefully you all get to experience all the wild power fantasies that have been lacking in Diablo 4 thus far. But as always, thank you so much for watching this video. I truly hope that it helped and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.